Hello and welcome to one more video of the pulmonary hypertension series in pulmonology read aloud. My name is Dr. Anshumane Jarora and in this last video of the series we'll be talking about the treatment of pulmonary hypertension. Before I begin the video I'd like to thank all of you who subscribe to my channel and for all of those who I met recently during a bronchoscopic workshop. It was lovely meeting you and to hear the feedback and reactions. So keep watching and keep reading. So when we start with treatment of pulmonary hypertension, it's very important to look at the pathophysiology of pulmonary hypertension. And we know that it involves around uh, basically vasoconstriction, thrombosis, intimal proliferation, remodeling and fibrosis which causes vascular obstruction and ultimately may lead to right heart failure. There are three target pathways that you can target to give treatment to the patient. First one is the endothelin pathway. Now endothelin through proendothelin 1, endothelin 1 causes vasoconstriction and proliferation and this acts through the endothelin receptor A or B on the pulmonary vascular smooth muscles. So what do we do? If we are able to block endothelin receptor A or B, endothelin 1 cannot cause the vasoconstriction and proliferation of the intima and that's how you can use this pathway. The second therapeutic target is the nitric oxide, guanyl cyclase and cyclic GMP pathway. Now the role of nitric oxide is to cause vasodilation and it's anti-proliferatory. So one, if we can give nitric oxide exogenously, it will be helpful. Two, the nitric oxide pathway involves uh, guanyl cyclase and ultimately cyclic GMP. So if you can promote and give guanyl cyclase analogs, then you can cause more nitric oxide function of vasodilation and so you can help. But one problem is with PDE5 and PDE5 inhibits this effect by causing more and more degradation of guanyl cyclase. So to counteract that, PD-5 inhibitors can be given at this point to promote the vasodilation. The third pathway is of the prostacyclins and prostacyclins cause vasodilatation and anti-proliferatory effect. So by giving prostacyclin analogs, whether IV, subcutaneous or orally, we may be able to make use of this pathway and prevent the smooth muscle proliferation. Uh, intimal proliferation, uh, we can prevent the hyperplasia and we can prevent the vasoconstriction. So let's further and decide how we decide on treatment for patient. Two important things are very important to decide on treatment. According to the ESCR guideline, firstly we have to look at the functional class of the patient. Is the patient is WHO function class 1, 2, 3 and 4. Essentially it means that does the patient have any limitation of physical activity, a slight limitation of physical activity, a marked limitation of physical activity where even less than ordinary physical activity is causing problems or he is not able to carry out his physical activity. Obviously, if your patient is in a lower functional class, he has a better prognosis and he might not need multiple combinations of drugs. If the patient is in your fourth functional class, he might need all that's available to us and he would be uh, having a lot of disability. Along with the functional class, we need to assess the risk assessment. Now, this basically is the determinant of prognosis of mortality over a year. So if a patient is a low risk, intermediate risk or high risk, if you use the three strata model and divide it into three risk strata, then you can estimate which therapy would be better suited for this patient. There are a lot of clinical uh, observations, there are a lot of variables that are taken into account for this and amongst the clinical signs it would be signs of heart failure, progressive symptoms, syncope and the WHO functional class. So patients class 3 and above go into intermediate risk, class 4 high risk and class 1 and 2 being the low risk. In terms of the investigations, we look at 6-minute walk distance which is readily available, easily doable in your own clinics and cardiopulmonary exercise testing if available. The biomarkers include BNP and T pro BNP levels and investigations include echocardiography and MRI to estimate the cardiac uh, 
cardiac imaging as well as hemodynamics as assessed by your right heart catheterization. So you divide it into low, intermediate and high risk and then based on the risk you can decide the treatment for the patient. Another risk assessment tool is the four strata risk assessment tool. It is simpler and it usually uses just few variables and it can be used for prognosis especially on follow-ups. Here patients are assigned points based on their WHO functional class and as well as sum of all grades dividing by the number of variables can give us some points which can be assigned. Secondly, we can look at the six minute walk distance and the BNP or anti-pro BNP levels which can tell us if the patient is in one of the four risks, the low risk, intermediate to low risk, intermediate to high risk or high risk. Once we know that, we go and embark upon managing our patients. Now, the general principles of managing a pulmonary hypertension patient remain the same whether the patient is in group 1, 2, 3 or 4. And these have been clearly demarcated by the guidelines. Firstly, it's important to keep the patient physically active and to enroll him in a supervised rehabilitation program. It has been noted that active exercise training can improve the six minute walk distance, the quality of life, patients can be more stabilized with medications and on those patients where you start the pulmonary hypertension treatment, all of those should be enrolled in a rehab program and encouraged to do physical activity. The second principle is anticoagulation. Now, there have been enough evidence that there could be in situ thrombosis in the pulmonary vessels uh, and that pulmonary hypertension, pulmonary arterial hypertension is a procoagulant state. So, anticoagulation should be beneficial. However, there are no major randomized control trials. The data is uh, not consistent. So, the guideline as a whole cannot recommend anticoagulation for each and every patient. However, if you look individually, there have been cases where there could be an improved survival benefit in patients and in those cases, uh, the guideline recommends that on a case-to-case -case basis, you may decide to give anticoagulation or not because ultimately there is also a high risk of bleeding. The third principle involves around diuretics and why diuretics are mostly used is because there is a right heart failure component in pulmonary hypertension. So three main classes of the diuretics whether it's loop diuretic, thiazide diuretic or mineralocorticoid receptor antagonist can be used. You can use them in uh, directly, you can use them in combination, monotherapy or combination and however it's important that whenever you're using a diuretic you will regularly monitor the electrolytes and the kidney function test and uh, all edema because may in a pulmonary hypertension patient may not be because of right heart failure and this is very important to remember certain drugs certain medicines which we use and we will see that in the adverse effects can also cause edema so do not start diuretics just because there is edema make sure it's indicated and signs of right heart failure are there the fourth uh, principle is oxygen therapy and often it's presumed that oxygen has to be given in pulmonary hypertension patients but really if you look at pulmonary hypertension patients per se the data is not consistently available from huge trials obviously because of a lot of limitations so what they have done is they have extrapolated data from COPD patients because they are also uh, having long-term hypoxia and so they extrapolate the data and say that if the partial pressure of oxygen PaO2 is less than 60 or if you roughly say that the saturations are less than 90%, then this patient should be given a domiciliary oxygen. And there is direct benefit of oxygen causing a decline in pulmonary vascular resistance, of oxygen causing an improvement in patient's quality of life and also improving the nocturnal hypoxia. So nocturnal oxygen therapy should be considered in case of sleep related desaturations. The fifth group is one of cardiovascular drugs and 
all cardiovascular drugs cannot be safely given in these patients so the word of caution is that these drugs sometimes can cause potential dangerous hypertension potential drop in heart rate so um, the safety of drugs which are used in systemic hypertension or heart failure drugs like ACE inhibitors angiotensin receptor blockers or um, SGLT2 inhibitors beta blockers and and digoxin digitoxin ivabradin these drugs should be used with caution if your patient is on these drugs make sure that it's indicated keep keep evaluating the patient on follow up because some drugs like though digoxin digitoxin may be helpful uh, to slow down the ventricular rate if they have arrhythmias or tachycardias but these drugs can cause hypertension in these patients which will not be beneficial so we have to be cautious now something else that's really important is to look at the patient's anemic status because iron deficiency is very common in patients with pulmonary hypertension it may be contributory to the patient's overall breathlessness fatigue and quality of life so patients who have iron deficiency whose hemoglobin is less than 8 whose serum ferritin is less than 100 should be given an iron supplementation these could be given in the form of oral supplementation in fumarate sulfate malate forms or sometimes when the patients are unable to uh, tolerate oral iron supplementations iv supplementation can be recommended so this is really important and um, since since iron absorption may also be impaired in patients with pulmonary hypertension we must keep a close watch on it something which is universally applicable to copds ilds ph or any other chronic lung diseases the role of vaccination so at least influenza pneumococcal vaccine and now the covid vaccine has to be ensured and the last uh, very important consideration is about pregnancy because pregnancy has unforeseeable risks it may accelerate the progression of hypertension there may be a very high uh, mortality or morbidity so if you if the woman uh, with pulmonary hypertension is of childbearing uh, age then they should be given very clear contraceptive advice uh, we should take this topic uh, with lot of sensitivity and recognize the implications make also recognize that there could be contraceptive failure and however if does if the pregnancy is continued with all the risks taken by the female then amongst the drugs it's important to stop endothelin receptor antagonists uh, rosiguat selexipag because they have unknown and potential teratogenicity what can be safely considered in pregnancy again there is not much evidence is prostacyclines uh, pd5 inhibitors and calcium channel blockers moving on to one more consideration amongst the general management is of travel so it is seen that hypobaric hypoxia or reduction in the pressures and hypoxia can cause arterial hypoxemia so there will be more vasoconstriction and there could be worsening so if your patient is taking a flight if it's a short term change if it's less than a day Uh, pressure is maintained it's normal baric hypoxia usually they will tolerate it well however even in flights uh, the pressures can can be reduced uh, and they could be simultaneous with pressures of around 2000 meter height elevation so in flight oxygen administration would be required for patients who are already hypoxic at sea level or patients who have a saturation of 92% so in these cases you should recommend in flight oxygen and a flow rate of 2 liters per minute would usually be enough to give them similar oxygen pressures as in sea levels and so they they must continue to use it during the flight however for patients with low risk and not hypoxic at baseline they can avoid it as well coming to the overall recommendation these are the general measures and recommendations uh, this is a beautiful table if you look at class 1 recommendation they are 
based on immunization which is very important supervised exercise testing as well as pulmonary rehabilitation treatment of iron deficiency and in flight oxygen administration so this can be taken this is taken directly from the guidelines and you can refer to it the the next section talks about the drugs used in primary hypertension and the main drug categories are as we had discussed endothelin receptor antagonists which could be targeting endothelin a or b receptors calcium channel blockers pd5 inhibitors prostacycline analogs prostacycline receptor agonists and gmp stimulators which again work on the same pathway so the treatment in patients with uh, group 1 hereditary idiopathic drug induced ph or ph associated with connective tissue disease usually starts with a confirmation of diagnosis if your patient does not have cardiopulmonary comorbidities in a class 1 patient then he does not have cardiopulmonary comorbidities you can stratify him according to the three strata risk classification if the patient is in the low or intermediate class of risk strata assessment you need to start him initially with endothelin receptor antagonists plus pd5 inhibitor therapy so dual therapy in class 1 if the patient has a higher risk then he starts on initial endothelin receptor antagonists and pd5 inhibitors and iv or subcutaneous prostacycline analogs for patients with class 2a so dual therapy in a low functional class 1 higher strata higher risk then probably a triple therapy may be needed we regularly follow up this patient and we reassess his risk using the four strata classification this time divide him into low intermediate low intermediate high or high if he's a low risk then he continues the same therapy if he has intermediate to low risk you may wish to add a pros a pra you may wish to add a prostacycline receptor agonist or you can switch his class so now he's in a higher risk so instead of pde5 inhibitor sildenafil pd5 inhibitor therapy you can go ahead and introduce soluble guanylate cyclase stimulator therapy if your patient has cardiopulmonary morbidities irrespective of the risk category you would start him initially on a monotherapy because he has more risk of side effects you would start with pd5 inhibitor or endothelin receptor antagonist and you follow him up and you individualize the therapy so this is a very important slide and that's why i went more slow on it please take a screenshot of this and it's very very important because it summarizes the treatment of pulmonary hypertension at large now let's go ahead and look at the drugs used for this treatment so this is a beautiful table taken from the guideline statement itself the first class of therapy is the calcium channel blockers calcium channel blockers amlodipine diltiazem philodipine and nifedipine are commonly used these usually start on a lower dose but the target dose is much higher So starting dose of amlodipine goes on to up to 30 mg OD. So it could be 3 to 6 times higher target dose for getting a significant result. But remember calcium blockers will be only and only indicated to vasoreactors. We would not start calcium channel blockers to all pulmonary hypertension patients. And this is what I'll be talking about when I talk about this group. So let's talk about the other therapies which can be helpful in non vasoreactors. So this includes endothelin receptor antagonists, orally administered group ambrisentan, bosentan and mascitenta, phosphodiesterase 5 inhibitors, orally administered group sildenafil, tadalafil, prostacycline analogs orally administered are berprost, berprost extended release tablet 
and triproprostenil which is available as subcutaneous and inhaled medication less commonly available as oral the prostacyclin receptor agonist is selexipag a new drug an oral drug soluble cyc gc stimulators or gonalate cyclase stimulators so causing more nitric oxide mediated benefit riosigwat prostacyclin analogs or by inhaled administration which is iloprost and triproprostenil and prostacyclin analogs iv or subcutaneously administered epoprostenol and triproprostenil so this is the group and this is the basket of drugs that we have to treat pulmonary hypertension let's start with understanding how they are introduced and then we'll go on to individual drugs so if you see these drugs are sequentially combined and as you remember from the flow chart we discussed if your patient does not have a cardiopulmonary morbidity you can probably start with dual therapy or triple therapy but if your patient has a cardio uh, cardiac cardiovascular comorbidity then you would start with monotherapy so class 1 recommendation says that it is very important to base treatment escalations on the risk assessment and the general treatment strategies first also addition of other compounds can be done based on the patient's prognosis and patient's follow up like addition of mascitentan a uh, uh, era to pde5 or oral or inhaled prostacyclin to reduce risk of morbidity mortality similar to what we read in the flow chart addition of selexipag to an era again when you feel it will help reduce the morbidity addition of triproprostenil when you feel it would risk reduce the risk of morbidity so addition of other treatment can be done later on and you could start from a monotherapy or a dual therapy again addition of sildenafil pd5 inhibitor to epoprostenol is recommended to improve exercise capacity the rest of the recommendations are great class 3 class 2 and above so addition of various compounds can be done to improve the patient's exercise capacity but we start with one and we base it on his risk assessment go on to individual drugs and we'll pause at individual drugs and we'll go on to see the treatment for connective tissue and lung induced ph in the next part of this talk so calcium channel blockers is the first group i said nifedipine diltiazem and amlodipine are the most commonly used ones the most common adverse event is same as a systemic hypertension peripheral edema as we see in our systemic hypertension cases also so watch out for this adverse event remember to reassess your patient after 3 to 6 months of therapy and because only vasoreactive patients will be given calcium blockers so a right heart catheterization may be needed and additional acute vasoreactivity testing may be needed patients who've shown a good response who've shown a good hemodynamic improvement where the pap mean pap has gone down less than 30 while on ccb therapy will be continued on it and if needed you can increase the dosages those who do not undergo a vasoreactivity study or who have a negative test should not be started on calcium blockers because they have lot of severe side effects the target dose required is much higher than your usual doses and this can cause worsening of the patient unless it's given for another indication so recommendation clearly and one take away from it is only recommended for vasoreactive patients in group of iph heritable drug induced associated pulmonary hypertension coming to the second group endothelin receptor antagonist we saw it here they work against the endothelin receptors a and b the binding of endothelin 1 to receptor in b will cause vasoconstriction so we basically do not want them to bind and so promote vasodilation remember they are teratogenic and not to be used in pregnancy amongst these first medicine is amrisentan amrisentan is an oral medication it blocks endothelin a receptor the doses approved are 5 and 10 mg and the most common adverse effect is edema 
The next medicine is Bosenta. It's also an oral medication. It is a dual ERA. It blocks both ERA and B. And it is known to improve the exercise capacity, the functional class, the time to clinical worsening in this patient. Target dose 125. We usually start with 62.5. We monitor the LFTs. We monitor the response and go up the dose because there is a dose-dependent increase in liver transaminases. So a monthly LFT, and this is my key takeaway, monthly LFT has to be performed when you're keeping someone on Bosentan. Remember, it has a lot of drug interactions, including with contraceptives, warfarins, and sildenafil and tadalafil. So this drug has to be seen in that context. Coming to Macitentan, it's also an oral dual ERA available uh, nowadays. One reported adverse event is a hemoglobin reduction, so just watch out for anemia. Coming to the next group, which is phosphodiesterase 5 inhibitors and guanylate cyclase stimulators. So here we have sildenafil, tadalafil and riosigwat. Now, sildenafil, tadalafil are PD-5 inhibitors and riosigwat is a guanylate cyclase stimulator. So, it promotes the nitric oxide pathway and it helps in vasodilatory effect. Remember, we do not combine them with each other because if you combine a PD-5 inhibitor and guanylate cyclase in the same patient, you can have a severe systemic hypotension. So, no combination. What do they do? They inhibit the PD-5 inhibitors, inhibit phosphodiesterase activity, induced degradation of the cyclic GMP through negative feedback. So that's how they promote GC stimulation by nitric oxide. So the degradation is blocked and that's how you will have more soluble cyclic GMP. This is again back to the same. Nitric oxide causes vasodilation. It's anti-proliferate and it is promoted with guanyl cyclase. PD-5 tends to degrade it. So we stop PD-5, we give PD-5 inhibitors and we give stimulators of cyclic GMP and guanylate cyclase. So sildenafil and tadalafil, they are orals, both of them, potent selective PD-5 inhibitors. Uh, one major response to sildenafil has been exercise capacity improvement. The dose is 20 mg thrice a day and it causes vasodilatory side effects like headache, flushing and epistaxis. And headache is a very frequent side effect of sildenafil. Riosiguat is a cyclic GMP guanylate cyclase stimulator. So guanylate cyclase stimulators enhance cyclic GMP production and so in a dose of 2.5 mg thrice a day, it improves exercise capacity and hemodynamics. Side effects are mostly like PD-5 inhibitors and it is uh, available to be given orally. The last but the largest group is those of prostacyclin analogs and prostacyclin receptor agonists. What do they do? They improve the dysregulated prostacyclin metabolic pathway. So this causes vasodilation, it inhibits platelet aggregation. And most common adverse effects are due to the vasodilation. They also include headache, flushing, jaw pain, and diarrhea. So which drugs do we have in prostacyclin analogs? We have epoprostanol, iloprost, trepoprostanil, beraprost, and selexipag. Selexipag is the newest addition. Epoprostanol is mostly available as IV, and we'll just talk about that. So the oral drugs are Beraprost and Selexipan. So, Apoprostanol, Trepoprostanil, Beraprost, Iloprost and Selexipan. If you talk about the administration, then this is a continuous IV through pump or tunneled catheter. It does improve symptoms, it does improve capacity, but it is a continuous infusion pump. The half-life is just 2 to 3 minutes. The serious adverse events are because of this infusion system and it can even cause catheter related infections. So that is why this has to be given only in a uh, more controlled setting. Trepoprostanil is subcutaneous or IV or inhaled. Even oral has been uh, released, not approved in Europe still. Uh, again, it can be used with implantable pumps, but subcutaneous can also be given. It improves the 6-minute walk distance, it improves the pro-BNP and quality of life, 
and it can be combined and uh, in therapy with bosentan and sildenafil also when it is given it causes these improvements again infusion side problems are the main adverse effects beroprost is orally active and it causes a very short term improvement in patients uh, not major hemodynamic improvements no major long term outcomes so we use it very less frequently iloprost is inhaled and causes an increase in exercise capacity not freely available but um, there are few studies on iloprost and mostly it is used in control settings selexipag now available orally it's a selective prostacyclin receptor agonist uh, it comes after phase 3 randomized trials where either alone or with mono or dual therapy it reduces the risk of morbidity and mortality by 40% and also works directly by reducing the pulmonary vascular resistance it does have a few side effects it's recently been introduced so we're still looking at it and it's a very promising drug we've we've gone through this earlier and i'm coming back to it because it makes more sense now that sequential drug combination with many of these can be done to achieve a therapeutic target one mention on triton study because you may hear it again and again in lot of uh, talks and in your books so triton study was done on treatment naive patients with pulmonary hypertension where either they were given dual combination or triple combination so we wanted to see whether dual is better or triple is better they were given a dual combination with mascitentin and tadalafil so pd5 and era or a triple with um, mascitentin tadalafil and selexipac so you used all the three classes here again the group was group 1 and ph ctd at week 26 similar reduction in pulmonary vascular resistance similar increase in 6 minute walk test so there was no benefit of oral triple versus an oral double therapy initially but there was improvement in hemodynamic and exercise capacity so it just tells us that initially you can just start an endothelin receptor agonist antagonist and pd5 inhibitor and go for starting the treatment so initial dual combination is recommended but um, for patients in lower risk or intermediate risk initial triple combination is not recommended because we do not have enough support now we are talking about lower intermediate risk when we are talking about high risk patients we may have to add on these therapies uh, it has a class 2 class 3 uh, evidence but it can be tried in high risk you may start an initial triple combination with an iv subcutaneous prostacyclin analog and then you may again stratify the risk of your patient how do you follow up if your patients achieve a low risk status then you continue the treatment if your patients are intermediate or low risk despite receiving therapy their risk is not improving you can add selexipag and you can even switch from pd5 to rioseguat in patients who are at a high risk while receiving oral therapy you consider adding iv or iv subcutaneous therapy and refer them for a transplant evaluation and if you cannot add iv or subcutaneous therapy then you can add oral selexipag or rioseguat and add on the treatment this is how you follow up the patient what is green has to be done at all visits at baseline at 3 to 6 months every 3 to 6 months and whenever he worsens so these will form the baseline uh the ones which are in yellow you can consider doing them so at 3 to 6 months if possible you can do a right heart cath you can possibly do it when he worsens and orange again um so that you should consider orange you may consider it will be helpful if you do them so that's how we monitor the worsening and for follow up patients uh you have to keep on adding therapy if indicated if the patient is worsening there are certain interventional therapies um there is mention of balloon atrial septostomy to create a shunt which is rarely done pulmonary artery denervation it also has an uh, a very experimental role based on sympathetic drive and lung heart transplantation which definitely has a very important role what are the criteria for referring for lung transplant and listing 
all potentially eligible patients where transplant is an option in case the patient fails on treatment you send them and refer them patients with intermediate high high risk and higher scores the reveal score is a risk score so higher score can be sent patients with progressive disease recent hospitalization patients who require iv subcutaneous therapy patients with high risk variants or signs of other organ dysfunction must be referred for a transplant you will be listing patients who have been fully evaluated and prepared for transplant patients with higher risk scores patients with progressive hypoxia and patients who are progressive will be on the transplant list so dear uh, so dear friends so this is the end of the part 1 of the video the next video is a short video where we talk about the major changes or the major considerations in pulmonary hypertension in connective tissue disease and in group 3 uh, treatment so keep watching and happy reading thank you